Hi, everyone. My name is Mia Wright, and I'm the Director of Global Engagement. Welcome to Columbia at Home. We're excited to bring you a program responding to alumni questions about their benefits. We are so excited to have one of our top Columbia alumni um, librarians here tonight to answer any questions that you have ever thought of about our library benefits. After the presentation, we will take questions using the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. We hope to answer as many as we can, but we have a full house. So please just put your questions there. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Jonathan Bloom, who will speak a bit about his experiences using the alumni benefits at the library. Jonathan? Well, Mia, thank you so much for the fabulous introduction. And again, thank you so much for the marvelous turnout. Uh, this idea really came out of an alumni chat that we had on a Zoom call maybe a month or two ago. And here we are, and the turnout has just been extraordinary. So again, uh, my, my buddy and, and my partner in my business, who is a uh, Columbia College class of uh, 86, uh, teased me today that only at Columbia would a, would a webinar about libraries uh, generate 565 participants and, and counting. So uh, thanks again for all your interest. Uh, for book nerds like us, this is you know, uh, just great. Uh, as, as Mia pointed out, uh, we have a great presentations for you. Uh, I really come to enjoy meeting Amanda um, Abilskis. Um, she's gonna speak about 40 minutes. She's presented what what appears to be an excellent boot camp mini boot camp on using the alumni resources uh after that we will definitely take your questions uh we have a whole um a behind the scenes way of, of, of handling uh, the load and hopefully we're going to try to organize it into topic areas if we don't get to your questions uh don't worry uh, i'm going to curate all this up and write up a little faq or some sort of uh, top 10 engagement uh, assets that uh, the, the alumni association is going to post somewhere and so we can all touch it after the fact um, uh, and then uh, uh, very briefly, we'll go through what I do with the assets and then we'll take your questions. All right, so let's get started. Uh, let's do the least important thing uh, here is, is what I do and how I use the resources. My name is Jonathan Bloom. I am the managing editor and director of applied machine learning for Brookside Research. Uh, we are a bespoke analytics and machine intelligence firm for so-called actively managed pools of capital. And obviously the financial services jargon machine broke that day, but what that really means is, is we work for private equity, we work for family offices, and we work for hedge funds that are managed by people. And so it gives us the ultimate luxury in the financial services sector of not having to work for programmatic trade, trading algorithms and offers us a really wide swath of our coverage areas. And just to give you an example of what we get to do, uh, right now we're doing forensic analysis on um, AI in uh, online automated lending, uh, and of which we're actually a little bit skeptical about. And we're looking into climate change in the wine industry as a leading indicator of the fragility of the food chain and potentially the agribusiness going forward. Uh, there is good news there. Actually, nice vineyards are coming online in Canada and Western Russia, which is actually kind of a positive. Um, if anybody has any interest in what I do and how I do it, uh, please let me know directly. I'm happy to answer it, but that's not what we're here to do today. What we're here to do today is talk about my relationship with the Columbia Libraries, and uh, it couldn't be simpler. Uh, I graduated in 1983, and pretty much throughout those decades, I've gone to 116th Street, I've gone to the Hungarian pastry shop, I would order something that I probably shouldn't eat, and then I would go indulge in exploring the topology of knowledge that is the Columbia University Libraries. I would start at Butler, uh, but you know, you never stayed there. I'd go off to the business library or the math building. I, I seem to remember winding up in the basement of the rec center during research, though that isn't really technically possible, but the nooks and crannies of knowledge are really part of the fun. And you always not only get an asset, but you get a topic expert. You know, you're always rubbing shoulders with real geniuses and people who love what they do. And that's why I really come to love the libraries. Uh, when the pandemic rolled in, I'm not gonna lie, it was challenging. Uh, there are tense exchanges between myself and librarians. As you get to realize I couldn't do what I used to do anymore. And so we adapted and uh, I was directed to the alumni resources and found them very useful. And so there are two main things I do with it. If you're on there on the homepage, you can see in the lower left, it's called Emergent uh, Business Resources. Uh, it's basically a simplified version of Bloomberg, but it's actually very powerful. There's no complicated prompts to it, and it exports extraordinarily clean financial data that's normalized into really solid classifications that make research and analytics 
uh, very exciting. And if anybody's interested in how I do that, I'm happy to pass that on. Uh, the other really awesome asset that I cannot recommend enough is the JSTOR um, Academic Research Archive. Uh, it's extraordinarily powerful, and, and really, there's just no reason to use Google Scholar anymore. I just think that tool is really sort of end of end of life, to be quite honest, and I just get um, extraordinary results from that. Uh, my sleeper pick, there's some great Judaic resources there. Um, the, the Talmudic assets and then the uh, assets of modern uh, Judaic knowledge are also very useful. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, please get them to me directly. Um, but that's pretty much what I do. And uh, before I formally introduce Amanda, I just want to say how much I commend this university for taking something like this on. Um, I really think it's an act of sort of corporate graciousness and uh, enter a sort of kindness at scale that they would take the time to organize something like this about a topic that's delicate. And I just think it's a real credit to the university. I, I really do. All right, so on to our main speaker here. Uh, I just want to take a moment and make sure I, I establish with all of you who this uh, knowledge professional is. She's a Quite a, quite a fascinating person. It's Amanda Bielskas. She is the director of the Science, Engineering, and Social Science Libraries at Columbia University. Out of 22 million total holdings that the library controls, this woman manages seven libraries, 11 million books and online assets, and half of the purchasing budget. And the fabulous collection that he, she helps manage not only predates both the United States and the Dutch colonies, the oldest holdings date back to the Sumerian era. That's roughly 2300 BCE. So you can go touch this stuff if you properly arrange it in advance. Amanda earned her Master's of Library Science at Long Island University. She has advanced degrees in environmental geology and anthropology. She's co-authored a book with Kathleen Dreyer entitled I Am and SMS Reference Services for Librarians. And Columbia has enjoyed her expertise since 2007. Prior to that, she worked at the City University of New York and at the library at the American Museum of Natural History. I can't wait to arrange a special tour there. In her spare time, she's an avid birder, reader, jeweler, and photographer. Ladies and gentlemen, Amanda Beskis. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the, for the great introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so um, as Jonathan said, I'm a librarian here at Columbia um, and I'm the director of the Science, Engineering and Social Sciences Libraries, which as of this week, we just opened one on the Manhattanville campus. Um, and so as of this week, I manage uh, seven of our library locations here at Columbia, which is great. So we just opened one in Manhattanville. So that was very exciting for us uh, this week. Um, I worked here at Columbia for about 14 years and I've been a science librarian um, and my roles have changed over time, but now I'm the director. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned, this is gonna be kind of like an introduction to the resources that you have access to um, through the library as alumni. And it's kind of gonna be like a little mini boot camp orientation to all of the benefits that we hope you are able to take advantage of. So I'm gonna do um, a slideshow that'll cover all of the things that I'm gonna talk about in my talk. And then um, if we have time, I'm gonna jump into our website and show you some of the resources if there's time permitting. And then I want to remind you also to use the Q&A to ask questions. Um, and I really want to thank all of you that contributed questions in advance. It really helped inform my presentation. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to actually answer them as I go through my presentation. But then those um, questions that you still have, um, we'll get to them towards the end of the presentation. So I'm going to share my screen here. And hopefully you will be able to see the slideshow. I'm going to just launch the PowerPoint and hopefully you can all see um, my show here. So uh, we like to think of the libraries as your library for life. Um, the alumni get to um, enjoy numerous benefits from the libraries throughout uh, once you graduate. Um, from our physical libraries um, on campus, but also the remote offerings we um, allow you to access uh, remotely through our alumni um, gateway webpage. So the highlights um, of the benefits that I'm gonna talk about today um, cover both your physical access to the libraries, your ability to get borrowing privileges from our collection, our Ask a Librarian services, and also most importantly, the focus of my presentation is gonna be what you have access to electronically um, for alumni through our website. So everything that I'm going to talk about today um, is available through the library's website, which is just library.columbia.edu. 
We are also going to share these slides at the end of the pre. Uh, we'll, we'll email the slides to everyone that registered along with the recording of the presentation so that you'll have access to these slides after, which will hopefully be helpful. I've included some links in the presentation directly to some of these resources. Um, but everything is findable just from library.columbia.edu, specifically um, the alumni um, webpage, which is available off the services and tools. You can also just search for it in our search box and you'll get to the alumni um, page, which is this landing page, which lists all of the resources that I'm going to highlight and um, also gives you directions on how to ac access them, which I'm going to also do here um, in the presentation right now. So. Um, Right now, because of COVID, alumni are currently limited access to Butler Library only, but you are um, able to come to Butler and go through the library information office during their business hours. And then um, once you show proof of vaccination, show a government issued ID, and you just have to complete a daily um, symptom attestation paper form, and then they allow you into Butler for that day. Um, we just got word this week that probably either likely by the end of um, this month or sometime in February or early March, we are going to start requiring boosters for visitors as well. So that's coming soon, but right now, um, as of today, you still just have to show proof of your vaccination. Um, we are also still requiring masks um, and there's currently no eating in our spaces. The campus rules um, actually just changed last week and now we're also requiring surgical masks um, in our spaces as well. So just be aware that that rule changed last week. Um, in addition to surgical masks, if you wanna wear um, uh, an upgraded mask such as an N95 that is allowed, but we're requesting that um, just uh, no um, fabric masks alone are not um, enough anymore. So you have to wear at least a surgical mask, if not like an N95. And there's a link in the presentation to the other types of masks that are also um, available, eligible to um, qualify for that. If you are interested in our borrowing privileges, they cost $30 a month and you can um, put in your application for that in the library information office and you just have to show your government issued um, photo ID. The library information office is, uh, you're probably familiar with already, but it's right um, as you walk into Butler before you get to the security desk, it's the office immediately to your left as you enter Butler library. So you just go there, um, tell them you would like borrowing privileges and it's $30 a month. Um, the only exception to borrowing uh, privileges is that the law school, teachers college and health sciences libraries um, don't participate in that, but all of the other libraries um, in the Columbia system do participate in that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another service that's available to you um, as alumni that's really useful is you get to tap into um, the wide breadth of expertise available to you through the librarians at the libraries. So we have an Ask a Librarian service where you can um, you can either chat through the chat widget um, with a librarian at the other end, um, or there's also links to contact our library subject specialists directly through this page, or um, you get their email contact information as well um, as other um, alternative means to contact us. But this is a great um, tool to be able to contact all of our experts in the libraries and ask them questions and um, ask them about our collections, ask specifics about our holdings or information or how to get um, that kind of information for your research needs. You're also eligible to take um, our workshops that we offer and use our research guides, which also point to resources that would be available um, both on and um, off campus in some cases. So it's a really great um, tool that I encourage you to take advantage of to ask our, um, my colleagues here in the libraries for, for assistance with your research. Um, so now I'm going to get to the meat of the presentation, which is to talk in more detail about the electronic resources that are available to you as alumni. Um, so they're open to graduates of Columbia Barnard Teachers College and the Union Theological Seminar Seminary. Um, and all you need to do is have a university ID, uh, which we call here the uni, which is the university networked ID, which is an identifier that's assigned to you when you come in as a student or a faculty 
um, or staff. And it's basically your initials and some numbers that then provide access to our information systems, such as like Lion Mail, which you might have had when you're a student here, um, or the library resources. So that's you also need that to access the alumni um, database gateway. So um, if you have trouble or don't have a uni, there's a couple websites on this slide that I would like to point you to. Um, you may either need to activate your uni or change your password if you have not um, set that up or if you've forgotten your password over time. So these two links on this screen will help get you um, to reset your password or um, will point you to the CUIT kind of web pages that help you um, get that kind of uh, trouble with your uni set up. Um, just to avoid confusion, some people might be confused and think you need to log into your My Library account, which is not the case. You don't have to log into your library account at all to access our electronic resources. So just, you don't even, you don't even need that. It's really only um, associated with the borrowing um, that you do here. So in order to just access our resources, you just have to log in with your uni. Um, also, when you're on campus, if you use the computers on our campus, you will have access to more of our resources than you would um, that are available remotely. Um, we, are, uh, we are actually among, we, we did a survey of our peers and we provide the most robust electronic access um, of any of our peers that we asked um, for alumni, which is really great. We provide over 30 databases that are available to you um, electronically, um, remotely. And none of our other peers um, had as many resources available. Um, we would like to offer more, but as you know, um, we're kind of restricted as to what we can offer uh, alumni due to the vendor and licensing terms. They like the vendors actually um, give the libraries a great deal for us to subscribe to things because they get students used to using the resources. And then as you graduate, get jobs and work in the real world, they want the companies and the corporate entities to subscribe to the resources so that they get you know more more money for their products and get used to it as a student so we're restricted in some of the resources of what we can provide um, but that's mostly due to the vendor restrictions um, so as a reminder um, all of the resources that i'm going to talk about now you can get through through this alumni web page and i'm going to highlight a lot of the specific resources. So some of the questions that we got in advance were about um, different subject specific questions. So I'm kind of breaking them down into different themes so that will hopefully help you get an idea of what research resources will be good for certain subject areas. So we have a few that are really great for um, kind of all around. Oh, that's my next slide, sorry. So these, um, these um, resources are great for um, specific to Columbia um, kind of specific research or resources. So Academic Commons is um, our repository and includes um, recent dissertations. It includes um, print like um, uh, faculty and staff as well as some student publications. So the faculty and students can deposit copies of their um, presentations that they give at conferences, or they can also deposit copies of their journal articles that they get published. Um, it's the repository where we put all of the new um, dissertations in. Um, so you can find full text of any of those things in Academic Commons. Um, we also um, produce the Avery Index to architectural periodicals here um, at the Avery Library. And um, as an alumni, you get access to that index um, to um, search the architectural literature. Um, Clio, I think you probably are almost all familiar with is the library's catalog. So that's um, open and available for anybody to search. The trick with that is as an alumni, you can't access the databases through there. You have to go through the alumni page that I mentioned earlier, but you can still use Clio to search to see our holdings um, and anything that's open access, like the things in Hathi Trust, um, you're able to um, get access to the open um, resources that are listed in Clio. Um, and there's also links to academic commons from there. And there's also um, the spatial data catalog, um, which has some open resources as well. So there's a lot of information that you can find just through Clio, which I is one of the tools I use every day. 
Um, there's also some great um, information on the university uh, archives pages. Um, we've digitized numerous volumes, um, almost all of the Columbia Spectator, the record, um, the blue and white and numerous other Columbia publications, which as alumni, you know, you can go back through those um, kind of digitized collections and find old issues from when you were a student. And there's a whole wealth of digitized content on the archives pages, which are also linked from the um, alumni page, which I mentioned. We also have uh, collections that we've digitized and they're available through the digital collections at Columbia, which is another resource that's linked from that page as well. So those I wanted to make sure that I pointed out and those are all um, curated and created here at Columbia Libraries ourselves. Um, so um, a few of the great kind of all around electronic resources or general databases um, that are really great powerful tools that you have access to are the Academic Search Premier, um, which is the alumni edition of one of the EBSCO databases. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, JSTOR is a huge, great database. It covers um, a huge amount of content from basically every subject area out there. Um, it has, uh, basically it stands for journal storage and is a huge repository of digitized uh, magazines and journals, but it also includes eBooks. So, a lot of the eBooks that we purchase on that platform you have access to as well. Project Muse is a great database, um, contains journals, magazines, um, great resource in the humanities and has eBooks as well. I know a lot of you were asking questions in advance uh, about what eBooks do we have access to. And so um, these three uh, databases, JSTOR, Project Muse and Sage are three of the um, most robust collections of eBooks that you have access to. Um, for alumni. Another great resource that covers many subject areas um, that we have access to, that you have access to as an alumni um, is ProQuest. So there's several news resources, a couple health resources um, in the ProQuest databases. Um, and because of the wealth of content, even though these two resources are open, um, to anybody. Um, we include them on the page too because they have such a huge amount of information. The DOAJ, which is the Directory of Open Access Journals, and PubMed are also linked from the page as well. And they have huge volumes of just um, content that's open to anyone in the world, but there's a huge wealth of um, repository of journal articles in both of those sources that are open um, and they're really useful um, tools as well. So those are the general um, kind of common um, or like the, the biggest kind of databases on the page. And then I'm going to go into more subject specific ones uh, now. So um, the first three on the list here are kind of the really good ones um, for business um, and economics kind of research. Jonathan mentioned Mergent. Um, it's the same access you'd have access to um, on Mergent you have access to as an alumni. Um, business Source Premier is another EBSCO database that's great for business research. Um, it's uh, the alumni edition of that. And then on the ProQuest platform, um, the ABI Inform, and there are several news sources um, in the ProQuest database that are great as well. On the social sciences side, the bottom three bullet points on my slide are um, Adam Matthews Explorer, um, the a Associated Press style book online, and the um, Columbia International Affairs online database, um, also produced here at Columbia, um, are great resources that you have access to, which are great for social sciences resources. I'm just going to take a sip. Um, so for the history and humanities um, and religion uh, subject areas, um, these are the databases that I recommend for that. So the Cambridge Histories Online is a really great database um, if you're doing, you know, his historical or um, research in history. There are several of the ProQuest databases um, that are great on this subject area as well. And then the three at the bottom are kind of great uh, resources in the religion um, subject areas as well. Um, I'm a science librarian, so the sciences are kind of like my favorite place to, to be. So I'm uh, hopefully not going to it too much, but 
um, for the sciences, engineering, um, and health and medicine topics, these are the resources that we have available. The annual reviews actually covers, I would say, more than just sciences, but it's kind of like a little bit heavy in the sciences, which is why I put it on this slide. But you have access to everything on annual reviews as the users do here, which is great. So it's full uh, full text database, um, and you have access to that. It's a little it's it's uh, skews towards sciences, which is why I put it on this slide. But it's a great database all around. Um, <clears throat> and then we have uh, for alumni access to the journals of the American Medical Association. I don't want to read them all here, but um, there's more than just JAMA, which you have access to. You have access to all of the journals um, that the um, American Medical Association um, produces, which are listed here in the smaller font on this slide. There's also a couple of ProQuest Health uh, man Management and Medical uh, Library databases, which are useful. Um, I mentioned PubMed earlier, but that's a really great tool um, to use for health and medicine research, anything in biology. It's kind of like the go-to database um, for anything health, medicine, or bio. And then you also have access to the Synthesis Digital Library of Engineering and Computer Science, which is great for um, folks doing research in the engineering fields. Um, I wouldn't be a librarian if I didn't give you some search tips. So um, I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail, but these are some advanced search tips that I like to um, kind of highlight when I do talks to students. Um, so like kind of some insider librarian tips or tricks where you get to use um, some of our mad librarian skills um, in your own personal research. So um, you can use um, kind of like a question, and, the, and these kind of tips should translate um, to using in most of any, almost any database out there, including Google. So if you wanted to use these tricks um, to help you um, kind of refine your searching um, as you're doing your research out there in the world, like you're more than welcome to. You can use a question mark to replace a single character in a word, and then it looks for any letter in, in place of the question mark, which helps you expand your searches. You can use an asterisk um, as an ending and it will then find uh, variant endings, or you can also use it as a prefix and it'll find variant prefixes. So instead of like, if you just put mineral with an asterisk, it'll find mineral, minerals, mineralogy, and any other variant um, at the ending. So it kind of also helps expand your searches. And then if you're finding your searches aren't specific enough, if you use quotes around your searching, um, it actually helps you uh, do more precise searches and it'll look for those exact words in that um, phrase within those uh, paragraphs. So say you're searching for South Park and you just typed South Park, um, but most databases will put an implied and between the words like South and Park and it'll look for it, those words anywhere in the record, which is great, um, unless you're looking for something that's really common and then you get too many results. But if you look, if you put quotes around South Park, it will look for it where those words are exactly right next to each other. So it kind of makes your searching more precise and that will work with anything. Most databases accept um, quotation marks in their searches. Um, and then the three main, um, you know, Boolean search operators that will work in any database are the and, or, or not. And um, just if you capitalize those in your searches, you will get, um, better results usually. And then a lot of the databases that we have, which you have access to as well, will um, allow you to do advanced searches. And in those advanced search screens, you can also um, add you know, specialized limits or facets um, in your search, which will allow you to limit by language, year, um, location, format, um, and that helps you get more precise um, searches as well. Um, so um, I also like to mention that beyond your um, connections at Columbia and your benefits through us, you also, I also wanna remind you that you may have benefits through either another university that you may have also graduated from if you have multiple degrees or if you work at another institution um, or school. Um, you also, depending on where you live, you might have access to a local public library that can provide access to both, many resources, both in person and online as well. Um, and any person that lives, works, attends school or pays property tax in New York State is eligible to get a New York Public Library card. 
Um, you can apply online and get access to their um, resources remotely, or you can apply in person and get a card um, in the library. Um, locally for us, um, many people are also eligible to get um, library cards at Queens and Brooklyn public libraries, but depending on where you live around the world, there's public libraries um, everywhere. Um, so I just wanted to remind folks that you have those um, at your fingertips, depending on where you live as well. Um, if you want to stay in touch with the libraries, um, I encourage you to sign up for our library newsletter. Um, you can opt out at any time and we don't spam you that much. I think they mostly send it out like monthly. So um, they include information for alumni in the newsletter um, periodically. So um, I encourage you to, 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 to sign up for that um, and you'll get, you'll get on our mailing list and you'll get more information about the libraries and the services that we offer um, and highlight some of the kind of stories that are um, happening in the libraries and about our collections. Now I'm gonna end my slideshow and I'm gonna quickly jump into our website um, and do a quick demo on a couple of the databases to just kind of show you how to get there, how to navigate, and maybe I'll do a quick demo and search um, or two. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for one second and then I'm gonna um, just navigate to my web page and share my screen again. Give me one more second. I'm going to share. So now I'm on the library's website, which is just library.columbia.edu. You could either search in this box for alumni or my quickest way I have found to get to the, the web page is just under services and tools. And then you go for alumni and then you get right to our e-resources. Um, an alternative is if you're on the using the libraries webpage. Um, if you're on the using the libraries, uh, the alumni, there's like a little um, on the sidebar here, you can get to the alumni page that way. And you can also just search in Clio alumni. And there's that, that quick, um, quick search find um, or in the bottom right hand corner on the libraries, Clio searches the libraries website and you can get to it um, from here. So several ways to access this gateway, which is great. And then you just, once you're on here um, remotely, you can click through to any of these resources. And then most of them will ask you to log in with your uni and your password. One of my favorite databases, um, same as Jonathan is actually JSTOR. So I'm gonna jump into JSTOR um, it may or may not, oh, it's asking me for my login, which I have my computer remembering. So um, you just jump in, you put in your, your password, your uni and your password, and then you get to go into um, JSTOR. Um, I'll do, um, let's just do a quick search for Bald Eagle maybe. I'm using quotes just to use one of my little search tricks. Um, and then you can see that you have um, just over 6,000 results and you get images. You can use the, the right-hand side to see journals, book chapters, serials, images, documents, and other books um, in different subject areas. So you can basically just navigate between the search results. You can um, refine your search. Um, and you can kind of just see what you get. Um, JSTOR also has the art store platform within it. So there's a huge repository of art images from different museums and different um, content in there. And there's a whole wealth of information in here, um, which I really like. If you see something, um, you're able to click in it, see more about it. You can download the PDFs in most of these databases. Um, they'll have different formats, um, but you can go ahead and get a huge amount of content um, this way. Um, so let's see. I don't wanna do too much searching in here. Um, this might be a good time to jump over um, back to you, Jonathan, and see if there's any questions. I can do live searches, um, or I'm also happy to take questions. Um, no, absolutely. I don't know. I can, I'd also be happy to demo um, 
more databases, but I think well, let's, um, no, no, we have stuff here. Let, let's wade right in. We, we have plenty to do. All right. So, well, first of all, I just want to say it's like old home week, nothing like being online, 625 participants and, and 88 questions. And we all love the libraries. I, I'm really deeply touched because we all, I, it, it reminds me how much we love the, love the place. And it, it's like being there. So this is just such a great experience. All right, let's do some, um, uh, a quick paperwork. Um, just describe the relationship between the overall holdings and what's made available to the alum. Is there a strategy there or some way we can think about this as online users so we're not always starting from scratch about where we can find things? Just talk about that, how you think about that when you're organizing your, your, your resources. Yeah, that's why like in my presentation, I really tried to um, group them by subject. So kind of like depending on what area of research that you are trying to find information on, I kind of like would target those specialized databases depending on um, what resources you're really, um, you know, trying to do the research in. So, um, you know, kind of like maybe going back to the presentation and, and fit, you know, looking for the ones that are specific, like, like you mentioned, um, you know, for business information, um, you would really want to search like business source complete or mergent, um, some of the more business focused ones, if you were doing, um, you know, some of the more general or all around uh, searches like uh, academic commons or academic search premier or JSTOR are great all around databases that are great for kind of like general just searching like what am I finding, um, you can also search um, Clio that would help you find things in particular. Some I know you said you weren't a huge fan of um, Google Scholar. I do use Google Scholar as a tool and sometimes that can also be useful. Like if you use it, it also links to open resources. So if you um, connect to like open access articles, you can get them that way. And you can also find through um, Google Scholar maybe what database a journal article might be found in. And then you can come to this alumni page and see if we have access to that database for you and then get to the article that way. Um, I know it is different because we don't have kind of like that e-link tool when you're on campus or as a student or a faculty, it is a little bit different. Um, and I do acknowledge that these um, databases are more like disconnected kind of as as an alumni but there are you know over 30 of them and they are great resources that you do have access to it just takes a little um, bit of work to kind of figure out what's the best one for your topic we we have several questions on on how to access the database do you think it's worth starting with like a clio a query and sort of walking us through how to start with a top line request and see where that takes you inside the available archive maybe that's the way to make it clear because there's a lot of interest in in how to best how to best use this quickly and maybe give us an example that you think or um think? well i mean i would use clio to find what we have in our collection so if you're physically going to come to the library i would use clio to find like what we physically have access to on campus right. but you would use it yeah. there but if for um databases for remote if you're off campus and you just want to like access these remotely you just have to come to this um, alumni page that I'm on right now, and then you just dive right into any of these databases. Um, you know, you can click the ProQuest ones, um, and it will just jump you right into that database. You would be um, asked to log in from that page, and then you can basically, once you log in with your uni, you just start searching the database, um, and you just do your searches, and then you'll get results and you can access full text. Not all of the databases do have full text, but a lot of them, most of them do have full text um, there. And you can um, even limit. So like in some of the databases like this one here, you can limit um, to full text and it will search um, within that database. And you'll see like this one is the alumni edition of ProQuest. Um, so I'll do, uh, I'll do, I'll look for a different bird. Um, I'm a big birder, so I'm just going to use some bird examples here. Cool. So, oh. let's see. So this one had a couple results, um, less Got so it. than JSTOR, but there is. Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, and then there's the full text is is right here. Okay. 
Uh, we got an interesting question. Uh, alumni are not authorized to access many ebooks. If I pay for borrowing privileges, does that authorize more access to those books? What do you think about that? So the borrowing privileges are just um, are just for our physical borrowing. So it's borrowing physical books from our physical collections. It does, the paying for borrowing privileges, unfortunately, doesn't give you any additional electronic resource access. Um, and that is because of the licenses that we have with the vendors. Um, so if you're on campus, you can access our, our more resources from the machines on our campus, but remotely, even paying for borrowing privileges, you only still get the same e-resources um, on the alumni on the alumni page. So um, just double checking if we're, our, our privileges are limited to Butler, something like the rare book uh, manuscript library or the missionary research library, those are gonna be off limits to us still. You can area. actually access the RBML is open to alumni and all um, external mm -hmm. visitors, um, but any other campus, any, any of the collections in Butler, but right now because the campus, uh, because of COVID, the campus is a bit more restricted. So the other campus locations are currently not available. But we hope as the, you know, as COVID retreats and as the campus opens up more, we hope that that will again go back to the way it was and more locations will again be open to alumni. We got a good question about legal resources. Uh, the law school is probably not, not acceptable. Any advice on legal resources um, available? Um, I would say, I would say there's probably some good stuff in JSTOR, um, and then ProQuest would be the other go-to, but, um, nothing, nothing on the neighborhood of like LexisNexis, it's that that one is unfortunately not available. So, um, a little, you know, not such, uh, robust in the legal, um, kind of area, but if you do come to campus, you would be able to get access to LexisNexis, I believe, from our computers yeah. in Butler. We are a LexisNexis shop, and we have one of their light access um, uh, uh, licenses, and it works pretty well for us. So it's actually pretty affordable yeah. if they need it. I can, I, I can forward that to the questioner. Hey, we've got a really good question here. Uh, if you're searching for a particular academic article from a specific journal, but you don't know where in the alumni resources it is, is there a centralized way to look at all of the available assets or am I looking through each uh, subdomain individually and searching that way? Is there a centralized yeah, way to look? Un you... Unfortunately, we don't have like a, a centralized way to find it. It's kind of disparate in, in the resources are a little bit siloed for alumni. Um, I would like to see us have, you know, kind of like an A to Z list of things for alumni and that's a great, a great suggestion that I'll, I'll take back um, to see if it's possible to get, you know, kind of like a list of here's all the journals that are available um, in all of these resources. That would be really useful. Um, it, but right now, yeah, it is a little bit limited in that they are kind of these um, siloed resources and you kind of do, but like a tip I would say for that is to again, maybe try, maybe try in Clio. And if you look in the articles kind of section of Clio, you can maybe suss out like what database that um, journal article is in, and then you can check this alumni page. A lot of stuff is in JSTOR, a lot of stuff might be in ProQuest, some of it might be in the um, Academic Search Premier. You could even find stuff um, in Academic Commons. So there are a lot of possibilities, I would say. Um, but it is, you, you do, might have to do a little bit more digging to kind of figure out which database it could be in. Uh, gives the temperature of getting access to the Avery Architecture and Art Library. That's one of my favorites. Um, what's our that uh, What's our shot at getting back in there sometime soon? What do you think? Um, I'm ho I'm hopeful as like the spring um, progresses and COVID retreats that the campus will be more open. I I don't I don't have any inside knowledge of of when the building restrictions will kind of like loosen up, but hope hopefully you know sometime sometime soon. I I don't. I don't know. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of questions here, so I'm just sort of. Uh, uh, yeah. No, you're them. you're doing great. <laughs> oh no, it's just so cool. It's like being back to school. It's just it it <laughs> it's it, 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 it's great. Um, hold on a second here. 
Um, there, there was some interesting debate about organizing our cumulative resources and maybe going back to publishers and coming up with the means of potentially opening up the better privileges. Is, is, that a, is there any way we could enfranchise ourselves in the process? Or, you know, if it's a budget thing, maybe it's something we organize among ourselves. Uh, clearly, we've all had good, good runs in our lives. Uh, is that more headache than it's worth? We do, we do actually pay for some of these for the alumni. We we pay um, you know an additional fee to, to the to the vendors for some of these uh, databases. You know, if there's things that alumni are really, really interested in, we would always love to hear about that. Um, we would oh. You know, be happy to try to work with vendors to try to oh, increase wow. the number of okay. things that we have. But that being okay. said, they're not always willing for us to license it for you know including alumni because they like to sell it to you um, as you're working in the professional world. Um, but for those resources that they do um, kind of provide, if you if you see. Um, alumni resources at other institutions that we're not providing, you know, those would be a good head start on like at least the, the vendors would be willing to work with us. Um, okay. You know, having having, um, you know, contributions from alumni. Um, I don't know that we specifically earmark anything from alumni right now for the resources, but um, I, I would say that, you know, suggestions would definitely be welcome and that we would try our best oh, to subscribe to, yeah. to things. Yeah, when I, um, ask I, I, I have time. personally like worked with vendors um, as we're negotiating um, renewal for a database and we always you know ask um, the vendors if, if they provide access to our electronic resources. Um, I'm not sure um, if I highlighted it that much but the the SAGE um, database which I'll scroll down to um, the SAGE full text, SAGE knowledge, and SAGE research methods, you have the same access to that um, as you would if, if you were a student or a faculty. It's like the full text of everything that SAGE provides. Um, there's a lot of reference books. There's a lot of full text um, electronic books and a huge um, volume of, of data in their um, research methods and collections. And you have the same access as alumni as we do here. And that's something that we worked with them um, to provide um, access to alumni for. So it's it's like, a, there's a lot of great resources here. Um, obviously we can't offer everything, but we do our best to try to provide what we can for alumni. It's, it's a really great um, benefit, I think, here. I know, I, I love it. Just quick piece of housekeeping. Could you just highlight with your mouse the, the two I used? I, I wasn't clear when I presented. The JSTOR there in the lower left in the Merging Online Database. Oh yeah. That. JSTOR uh, and Mergent, two right next to each other yeah. here. Um, yeah. Um, a couple of quick questions as we're coming to an end here. Um, can we search videos? Someone is, is interested in sample therapy sessions. Are there um, linear media assets we can explore? Talk to us about that. Um, I yeah, believe that that. there are some videos in Sage. Um, so Sage, you might try Sage for some video content. Um, what are some other good video resources? This is a good one. I don't, I don't recall um, getting videos in all my, in, in all my years. I think that there's um, some available from Sage. That's probably the best one to try first. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd recommend Sage. There's definitely some decent videos in there, I think. And I don't, that's, for alumni, that's that's the one that jumps out to me the most. Um, I would say also, you know, through the, through the public library, sometimes you also have access to some video content, some streaming stuff. Even for us, um, for the regular users, it's actually challenging for us to license streaming um, content. Um, like a lot of the, the, the big players in streaming won't even work with libraries at all, like the Netflix and the Disney Plus. Like libraries can't even subscribe to that stuff um, at all. Hmm. Never mind uh, for alumni. So you're not alone in the fact that we can't get access to everything. Well, that, that's actually an interesting uh, bridge because we are getting a couple of questions on popular periodicals and access to audiobooks. Uh, what's your feel on that? Um, obviously, the ProQuest has some resources. We're in a, we're a Nexus shop, obviously, so we get all that stuff from there. 
But I mean, is the Economist in there and the New Yorker? I don't get them there. Um, are they in those databases at this point? New York Times. That I think the Times um, is in the Posted, if I believe. Yeah, some of the the newspaper content. Um, ProQuest, the U.S. newsstand, might be the good uh, the good go to for um, newspaper content. Is what I would recommend. Um, and then also the academic search premiere might be your best bet on some of those like popular magazine type things. Um, but I don't, it's hard to say exactly the content and sometimes they'll have, um, they'll have not cover to cover content, but they'll have select articles in some of the databases. So depending on the subject area of the database, it'll have like a few articles from, you know, like major articles on a specific topic, but they won't have cover to cover of like every single article in certain databases, but you can find select articles in num a number of, of the databases. All right. For newspapers, well, I, I definitely recommend the, the ProQuest uh, news. Stand. Okay. Uh, I will curate all this up into um, a lot because there's a pile of information here. I just want to end up, uh, talk to us about the future. Where do you see uh, the virtual side of the library going? You've got a long experience. Give us the professional's take on where this is going to go. I like it. I am not think? a futurist, <laughs> but I'll try my best. <laughs> um, I play one on TV, so, you know. You <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball, but I wish I did. Um, I see, I see the, the, the publication landscape, you know, the trends I've been seeing is like, there's a lot of consolidation in a lot of the, the publishing areas. Um, so I, I see that as both a good and a bad thing. I mean, like, as publishers consolidate, like their content gets um, kind of, you know, becomes more streamlined on single platforms, which is great for the users where they then have to go to less places to look for the disparate information, which is a great, but it also, um, you know, becomes challenging and uh, harder to afford um, sometimes for us for, for some of the, as the mergers, the mergers happen. I can tell you that probably within the next like few years, our back end of Clio will probably, it's reaching the end of its like lifespan, so to speak. So we'll be searching for a new, um, you know, vendor for our um, data that we hold um, our book records for. So, but I don't know that the front end of Clio will have that um, much of an impact on the users. Like we'll probably keep the same user interface for the front end that we have right now, which we use a system called Blacklight, which is great. We all love it here, so um, that might not change as much. But like the back end, where we store the records um, and the way the searching um, might change a little bit. Do you, do you see the topic areas changing, or you know, managing and storing information is such a challenge as information becomes ever more ephemeral? Do you see do you see Columbia's role uh, changing in 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 how we track, how we check information? Obviously, we're an era of fake news where truth is very hard to find. Where, where does how does the university play a role in that in, in in terms of its libraries? Yeah, I think the the libraries play. I like that question. It's a great question. Um, but I think the libraries play a really important role in kind of uh, collecting and curating um, both the the print and electronic collections that are out there. Um, a few several years ago, we've been doing it for years now. We started a web archiving program where we actually collect. Um, and collate and archive websites that can be ephemeral as they change over time. So we actually curate websites in certain subject areas and certain collections. We actually curate um, all of the Columbia uh, web pages so that we can kind of capture them for posterity um, and for knowledge for the future as you go back and wanna see how things were and what we were talking about um, in that time. So that's a great project that we do here in the libraries. Um, and it's really worthwhile for history. It's like as the web page, like we've lost, you know, back in the early 90s, how many web pages were lost that just like don't exist anymore. And all of that stuff mm -hmm. is gone. So like now that we know better, we're trying to curate and collect that stuff for the future and the future researchers. So things like that, I think are really powerful tools that libraries and librarians can do um, for our future and to record history as we live it. It's kind of cool. Well. We we, we've gone through all of our time. We have um, answered as best as, as we can. Like I said, to those of you who, who have tuned in, we'll do our best to organize this into resources you can touch. Thank you so much, Amanda, for, for doing this type of homework. 
and really, you know, um, what fun, you know, it's like being back in the, back at Butler, you know, it's really a, a pleasure. Thank you for uh, wrangling all those questions and for all your great questions and for um, tuning in today um, and for listening. Um, we really appreciate it. As we said, we will um, share the recording and the slides. Um, and I just want to thank you all for your attention. Amanda and Jonathan, thank you both so much for sharing all of this amazing information today. It, 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 was, it was such a pleasure to, to hear your presentation, Amanda, and it's such a, a wonderful spot on campus, Butler Library. So we hope that many of you that are on this event tonight can, can stop by. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about how to access the library benefits, please visit the Columbia Library's website directly at www.library.columbia.edu. And uh, like we said, we will be um, disseminating some more information from this, this event. So if you missed anything, you can, you can uh, be sure to catch that. We also hope that you'll join the CAA at their next Columbia at Home on Wednesday, February 9th. We're featuring six Columbia filmmakers per, uh, participating in this year's Sundance Film Festival. Additionally, the Black Alumni Council is hosting a series of programs throughout February celebrating Black Heritage Month. And to find those events and how to register, please visit alumni.columbia.edu. All of those wonderful programs will be listed. With that, again, thank you all for joining. What a wonderful evening. Have a safe night. Thank you. <laughs>